Okay, thank you very much and um, thanks for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, it's, a, it's a real honour and a privilege to be, to be speaking at this festival. Um, I wish we were in the burn, um, but it's wonderful just to see everyone's um, uh, locations popping up there in the, uh, in, in the chat box. There's people joining us from the USA, from East Yorkshire and from all over Ireland. So hi everyone, it's, it's really nice to be speaking to you this evening. Um, my research uh, is focused, as uh, Paranji said, in ecology. I'm an ecologist uh, and I, um, uh, I'm interested in a whole range of areas. And you can see from the slide here, the, um, the word cloud just describes some of the, the research areas that I'm interested in, and uh, the, the range of my research. Um, and I'm very much inter interested in the interactions between people and nature. And so my talk this evening uh, is going to be about Ireland's nature um, and uh, the state it's in, what we can do to ensure that both people and nature flourish. And uh, I will focus on bees um, as my favourite example. So Ireland's nature then, um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, is a product of our geographical location, our climate, the fact we were covered in ice until 13,000 years ago. And what we have now in terms of our nature um, is a result of glacial processes, uh, the plants and animals that recolonized Ireland until the land bridge was cut off about seven and a half thousand years ago and the long history of human activity on the island. And in terms of our biodiversity, the variety of habitats, uh, the variety of species, the diversity within species, we have some stunning biodiversity, stunning habitats from coastal grasslands to upland bogs and a wonderful range of flora and fauna within these habitats. And because of the moist, mild Atlantic climate, because of the diversity of lakes and rivers and bedrock, it means that we get some unusual combinations of species. So if we'd want to try and sum up Ireland's biodiversity in, in numbers, we have about 31 and a half thousand species living within uh, 117 different types of habitats. This is a very crude overview of Ireland's biodiversity. And Ireland is well known internationally for its lush green rolling hills. But as I'm sure many of you are aware, our biodiversity is under threat. So agricultural intensification on the one hand and abandonment on the other, urbanization, pollution, climate change, invasive species, all of these things threaten our natural systems and the plants and animals that comprise them. And in terms of our habitats, in terms of our protected habitats, almost all of them and 85% of them uh, these, ha these are habitats that are protected by, by European directives are in an unfavourable condition. So this is um, uh, data from Article 17 reporting to the European Union. So even though we have policies to protect habitats and we have a range of different habitats protected, it seems that they're not being particularly effective. So it looks like we have a policy problem in terms of our protected land. But most of the land of Ireland isn't protected. 64% uh, of the land area of Ireland is dedicated to agriculture and it's mostly under grassland, a lot of improved grassland. And this map here just shows how very different Ireland is to the rest of Europe. Um, so the red colour on the map represents um, a high proportion of grasslands. You see Ireland is almost entirely red. So um, this gives a little bit of context to Ireland to our biodiversity uh, and, and to what makes it special. Um, and in terms of this um, grassland, a lot of this grassland is farmed. As I said, 64% of the land area is farmed. And of that farmed area, only a fraction of that farmed land is semi-natural habitat. So uh, a recent study, actually this paper was just published last week, it's always great to be able to give a talk and say this is bang up to date stuff. Um, this is a data from a paper that was published last week as part of the Farm Ecos project, which is a Department of Agriculture funded project led by Dara Hulahan in Chagas. Um, and as part of this project, we did an analysis of protected land on um, some, uh, a sample of farms that, that basically span the range of farming systems in Ireland. And what we found that was between 6 and 40%, 41% of farm area habitat is semi-natural. So 6% in some of the more intensive farms, 41% in, in the most extensive farms. And things, semi-natural semi habitat like um, hedgerows and tree lines 
are protected under agricultural policy, as in there are payments uh, to, to protect these kind of habitats, but several other semi-natural habitats on farmlands, so bits of heathland, peatlands, woodlands, are not afforded a protection under agricultural policy, so not eligible for payment. Um, and these semi-natural uh, features can make up quite a sizable proportion of some farmland. So in some of the extensive farms in Sligo, up to 27% sorry, of habitat area um, it are these undervalued habitats. So a lot of Ireland's covered by farmland. Um, of that farmland, um, a, a proportion of it uh, are these, these um, semi-natural habitats. Um, and in some places, these semi-natural habitats are at risk because they appear undervalued because there's, there's no payments available for them in policy. So they're at risk. And so on the intensive farms, these semi-natural habitats have mostly gone. So we have a policy problem in our protected areas, as in 85% uh, of uh, protected habitats are unfavorable. We also seem to have a policy problem uh, in our agricultural areas. So we have these issues um, with um, habitat diversity and habitat loss. So that's at the habitat level. What about the species level? So I said there's about 31,500 species in Ireland, um, but the conservation status of only about 10% of these species has been assessed. And this means that we really have a fundamental gap in our knowledge about how biodiversity is doing in Ireland and how it's changing. In terms of what we do know of the species that have been assessed for their conservation status, one in five or one fifth of these species are threatened with extinction. This is actually quite a high proportion, I'm talking 20%. Um, so things like, you know, there's 37 species of birds that are of high conservation concern. And this includes species such as the curlew, the hen harrier, twite, the yellowhammer. Um, and, and species like the corn bunting has actually gone extinct within the last 20 years. And the once widespread corn crake is now just hanging on uh, in the western extremities of the island in counties Donegal and Mayo. Um, and when we lose habitat, we lose species that live there. And my area of interest and, and specialisation are, are the bees and other pollinators. And bees have become great flagships for biodiversity. And we know of our 99 species of bee in Ireland. So we have one species of honeybee, 21 species of bumblebee, and 77 species of solitary bee. One third of these species are at risk of extinction. So we have rather a high proportion of our native bee species at risk of extinction, nearly 30%. That's incredible. It's, it's, it's really too high. If we put this into a European context for a moment, uh, there's about 1900 species of bee across Europe. You can see on the map here, I've just highlighted the number of species in, in a few countries. 99 species in, in Ireland, 270 in Britain, 300 in Finland, um, increasing down to you know, nearly 900 in France and, and more than 1000 in the Iberian Peninsula. And of these 1900 species across Europe, despite the media, um, not all of these bee species are in decline. Some species are doing absolutely fine, um, but some species aren't. So the same sort of um, conservation assessment, this red list assessment has been carried out for, for bees across Europe. Um, and what this has shown is that if you see in this, um, this pie chart at the, at the, on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, um, about 34% of species are, are are of least concern. So LC stands for least concern. That means we're not, we're not worried about them. They, they don't, they're not at risk of extinction. But about 9% of these species that were, were assessed across the whole of Europe are threatened with extinction. And 9% kind of seems pretty good in comparison to Ireland's 30, um, but it's still not great news. And the worst thing I think when, when I look at this figure is this huge grey area on the left hand side of the chart. So this DD, 57% of species were DD, that means data deficient. That means we don't know nearly enough about them to quantify risk to them. And this is a general truth about most biodiversity, most species, particularly the invertebrates, the, the insects. We just don't know enough about them to be able to quantify their risk. Um, 
But we do have a good idea of what's causing decline uh, in bees and other pollinators and, and a lot of other taxonomic groups as well. And these can be summarized in these, these five points. These are, this is the language that we used in, in the pollinator plan to try and express uh, the drivers of decline um, of bees and other pollinators. So loss of these semi-natural habitats across the landscape um, leads to lack of places for, for bees and other wildlife to live, so homelessness. Um, and associated with this, a loss in and a decline in the availability of uh, food resources in the form of wildflowers uh, leads to hunger, so it leads to food shortages. Um, pests and diseases. Uh, we know from our own current situation that emergent diseases can be disastrous for populations. Uh, and this is the same in nature. Emergent diseases are one of the big pro um, problems with regards to bee decline. Uh, exposure to pesticides and other chemicals in the environment can cause poisoning and on top of all of this there's a changing climate both the the gradual increase in global warming increase in temperatures leading to uh, range and phenological so so shifts in timing um, of different species as well as the the increased frequency of extreme weather events things like storms floods droughts wildfires things that we we, we have seen increasingly over the last uh, few years and certainly over the last 12 months. And it's thought that a combination of these drivers is making things worse. So maybe our bees can cope with being sick as long as there's enough food, or they can cope with a, a monotonous diet as long as it's not contaminated with chemicals. So this is what we know in general, and the research that we're trying to do is to try to understand specifics for Ireland and the interactions between these different di drivers of decline. So in, in terms of wildflowers, do we just need more flowers or do we need a particular type of flowers? What resources do different bee species need? Um, and do plant species differ in terms of the nutritional value of the nectar and pollen, the food that they provide? And how much of that is contaminated with pesticides? How does this change through the year and across landscapes? And some of the projects that, are, that we're working on at the moment in Trinity are addressing some of these questions. So, we're trying to determine pesticide residues and impacts on different pollinating insects. To date, most of the impacts of pesticides have been studied uh, on bees. So we're trying to look at other insects. Do they respond in the same sort of way? Uh, we're looking at how floral resource use changes through seasons uh, and in different types of farmland. Uh, we're looking at what determines where solitary bees nest and how we can best protect them. And we're looking at the interactions between plants and pollinators and how these change across urban as well as rural landscapes. And so it's just, uh, that's just some pictures of, of some of my team who I will uh, credit fully at, at the end. And diversity does matter. So we know we can't just have one type of land use across the whole country, or that we, we can't just not worry about pollinator loss and we just, you know, don't worry about it. We can, we've, we've still got a single managed species, we can use that instead. Diversity does matter. So for example, I've put a couple of um, examples on here from, from some work that we've published over, over the last year or so. Um, these graphs basically show when you've got more species, so more diversity in species of pollinators, uh, and in natural enemies of crop pests, you get increases in rates of pollination and rates of pest control. And these are data gathered from studies from all over the world. So these are, you know, we're often, often trying to uh, determine these sort of general patterns and general trends. And these data quite clearly show that as you get an increase in diversity, you get more species, you get better pollination and pest control. Um, and if those species are more different from each other, uh, if there's functional diversity, so if, you have, if different species obviously have different traits, um, and, you know, different um, body sizes, different tongue lengths, they're active at different times of day, in, at different times of year. So, so more of this diversity uh, in terms of the traits uh, and what these different um, pollinators do can maximise yields. Um, these studies actually both refer to, to yields in crops because a lot of the, the research, a lot of the funding has gone towards um, looking at crop yields. So diversity matters and there's countless studies uh, that have shown diversity gives us resilience. 
So from year to year, um, to cope with changes in weather, to, to bounce back from perturbations, and, and diversity improves ecological functioning across many, many systems. And this is necessary for healthy ecosystems. So diversity does matter, uh, and we seem to be losing diversity. So what happens when we lose diversity? What, what are the implications uh, for the, the loss of diversity in uh, bees and other pollinators? Um, well, if we think about pollinators, 78% of plants in, in, in temperate Europe are insect pollinated. Um, and a lot of these plants make up, these landscapes make up this diversity uh, at the landscape level. Um, and they contribute to other things. So they contribute to things like flood alleviation and climate regulation, nutrient cycling, soil maintenance and function, and of course, wider biodiversity. Uh, and this all has wider benefits for, for our own health and well-being. And obviously, it's not all about bees and pollinators. And I know I, that's, that's all I'm usually talking about. And there's an awful lot of attention uh, on bees and pollinators at the moment in terms of, of biodiversity and biodiversity conservation. Diversity is important across the board. Uh, and some of the organisms that we appreciate the least are, as I mentioned, these ones that we don't know so much about, things like insects. Bees get all the attention, but other insects do lots of other important things ecologically and in terms of contributing to our own economy, society, health and well-being. And I'm sure many people in the audience are, are more than familiar with this. Uh, so dung beetles, this is a, a beautiful dung beetle here, they, they bury dung. Uh, this reduces spoiling on pastures. Uh, it means that uh, nutrients can be recycled and it also reduces the prevalence of pests and diseases. So having a healthy population of dung beetles provides multiple benefits. In the same way, natural enemies. So uh, a lot of insects are predators, things like these uh, ladybirds, lots of different kinds of beetles, lacewings, uh, parasitic wasps. There's lots and lots of um, insects that act as natural enemies of other insects and help to regulate populations of, of insects that, that may go on to be pests uh, where their population is not regulated. Um, and then the ants. I mean, the ants are an amazing uh, group of insects. They're incredible in, in ecological terms. They're important in terms of dispersing seeds. Uh, they're important predators. Um, and they're really important soil bioturbators. And, and earthworms often get all of the, the, the praise uh, for their work below ground. But ants also do a huge amount of work in terms of influencing soil um, chemistry, the physical properties, and um, uh, soil bioturbation. And I just wanted to, to uh, put in this quote from the, the famous biologist E.O. Wilson, who said that if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to a rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And this is a slide that I showed to, to, to my entomology students in Trinity, just to really get across the idea that insects are so important in so many different parts of our ecosystems. And I guess I am, I, I expect I'm preaching to the converted, uh, to, to those of you listening to this webinar, if I, if I say that biodiversity is important, you know that, we know that biodiversity is incredibly important to us. But not everybody appreciates that biodiversity has a value. Um, a conservative estimate of the financial value of biodiversity was made in 2008, um, that biodiversity was worth 2.6 billion euro per year in Ireland. And this was weighed up against how much was spent on conservation, which was considerably less. And so this big mismatch um, highlighted the fact that the value of biodiversity is much greater than the amount that we spend uh, on conserving it. And lots of the arguments worldwide for pollinator conservation have been based on their role as crop pollinators. So by calculating how much pollinators contribute to crop yields, uh, and the market price of crops, we can come up with a financial value uh, of pollinators and their services at different scales. So here's just some of those uh, values that have been estimated. So globally, 153 billion, uh, across Europe, 15 billion, and in Ireland, up to 59 million uh, euro per year in contribution to crop pollination. But as soon as we say biodiversity has a value, and we put these financial values, these euro dollars, 
uh, on, on nature, people start to worry that we're going to uh, start commodifying it and rightly point out that there are many values associated with nature that we can't and we shouldn't put a financial figure on. And this is because the true value of nature encompasses so many things. So if we think about the total economic value of bees and the pollination services they provide, they have a direct use value in terms of their contribution to crop protect production, uh, as just discussed uh, just now, and we can put a financial figure on that. But they also have a direct use value for things that aren't bought and sold on the market. So maybe medicinal plants or wild forage, foraged berries, or these plants make up the landscapes that we use for recreation. So these are a direct use values um, that are both marketable and, and those use values that are not. They also have indirect values. They contribute uh, indirectly to things that we use. They contribute to ecosystem function, as, as previously mentioned, including resilience to, to, uh, to environmental change, nutrient cycling, soils, etc. And then there are lots of values that are uh, associated with us not using pollinators and their services. They may be, may be of no value to us right now, but they give us the potential to do something different in the future. Uh, this means we have options. Uh, just their existence is of value to some people. people. There's, there's 20,000 different species of bee worldwide. I will never see them all. I'll never necessarily use anything they contribute to, but I do get satisfaction from knowing they exist. And this, this is a type of value. And finally, the, the sort of moral bequest value. We have an obligation to future generations to leave nature for them. And so when we talk about total economic value, it's all of these values together, not just those market values, those financial values. And, and as I said, most of these values should not and cannot be monetized. But by shining a light on the value that we associate with biodiversity by identifying what nature is doing for us financially or in terms of our well-being, our culture, by valuing it and accounting for it, it can, we, this can help to make sure that there's investment in nature. And this approach seems to make a lot of sense to people who aren't inherently nature lovers. Because if we do this by using the language of, of economics and business, uh, those people making decisions based on economic concepts start to get it. And this is basically the natural capital approach and what we're, we're advocating in the Irish Forum on Natural Capital. So it's not about putting a price tag on nature, but about bringing nature into the decision making process, making it visible where it's previously been ignored and bringing nature to a new audience um, and bringing a new audience into the arena of nature protection. And this is what we're doing in, in another one of uh, the research projects that I'm leading at the moment, the INCASE project. And INCASE stands for Irish Natural Capital Accounting for Sustainable Environments. It's an EPA funded research project. And what we're doing is we're quantifying ecosystem and geosystem components of landscapes. Uh, and we're actually working at a catchment level in four different catchments. Uh, they were quite different so that you see them on the map here. Uh, the Cara down in um, Kerry, the Bride in Cork, the Vigil in Offaly and the Dargal in Wicklow. And they have quite different land cover and land uses, these catchments, different pressures. And so what we're doing is, is we're mapping these catchments and working out what condition the different components of the catchments are in and what benefits they deliver to people and to nature, uh, the so-called uh, ecosystem goods and services that are fundamental to human well-being. Um, so in each of these catchments, we're working with stakeholders uh, and with a huge raft of environmental data. And this can uh, then help us to make informed decisions about how ecosystems are used. They can be used for, for planning, for land use development um, and trade-offs. And, and there are always trade-offs uh, in any decision making relating to the land. Um, these trade-offs aren't just made on what's bought and sold in the market, but actually can take into account these other values that we have. And this is essentially what natural capital accounting is uh, and what it aims to do. Um, and then once the value of nature is appreciated, then I think we can start to make better 
decisions, better policies that work better for nature. So if, if we go back to the semi-natural, unproductive areas on farmland that are being lost, if we can demonstrate the value of these areas in terms of carbon storage or in terms of habitat for wildlife, in terms of water or nutrient cycling and retention or pollination services, then we can start to develop and implement policies that protect them and even work out a fair way to pay farmers to maintain those habitats, you know, pay farmers to deliver public goods and services. And this is something that we're working actively towards with the Department of Agriculture. And the recently announced EU Green Deal and the EU Biodiversity Strategy um, highlights that the, the aim is to, to have 30% of land protected for nature by 2030. And this, this approach to um, understanding the, the, the different components of the landscape and, and what benefits we derive from different components of the landscape might be one approach or one way to help us to identify um, the best way to, to, um, to protect land for the benefit of both nature and for people. But it's not just policies that need to be changed, um, it's hearts and minds. Um, it's not just accounts that win people over, and I suspect many people in the audience wouldn't be won over by a set of accounts, um, but it's hearts and minds that make a difference for how we deal with nature. The breathtaking beauty of, of the burren in spring, the sound of bird song, the buzzing of bees on, on long, bright summer days, the fascination of finding an orchid flowering in an unexpected place. And initiatives like the All Island Pollinator Plan have been overwhelmed by support. And, and whereas the, the crop pollination argument might work well in other countries, here in Ireland, we don't produce many insect pollinated crops, although we do consume a lot of crops that are inputs, insect pollinated from elsewhere. That's a whole other story. But it's really, it's the hearts and minds argument um, that seems to be winning. People love bees. They see the connection between bees and food production, but they also get on board with the idea of doing their bit for nature. So through the All Island Pollinator Plan and by publishing these, these clear, targeted, evidence-based messages um, and advice, you know, people have really got on board from across a range of sectors. Um, and the positive messaging that's gone, um, that, that's occurred through the Pollinator Plan has meant that people have wanted to get involved. So we, we launched the All Island Pollinator Plan in 2015, and here we are five years later at the end of the first phase. Um, I don't think we ever thought we'd be as successful as we have been. People are taking action for pollinators. Many of the people in, in, in the audience here this evening, I'm sure, are taking action for pollinators across the length and breadth of Ireland. And this map shows um, the different sites and the different sectors. So each colour on the dot represents a different sector. Um, and, and we can see here that there's there's... Uh, from, from tracking what's been going on over the last uh, five years, there's about 4,000 actions that have been taken and over 3,000 square kilometres that are now managed in a more pollinator friendly way, which is just really, really incredible. And some of the key highlights, the key successes from, from the pollinator plan have been reaching out to every primary school in the Republic of Ireland uh, in partnership with SuperValue. Um, half of the, the councils across Ireland have already formally partnered and agreed to take actions for pollinators. 162 local communities have become pollinator friendly through, through the Tidy Towns programme with 239 business supporters. Uh, implementation of the plan is in the policy framework, so it's in the National Biodiversity Action Plan. And Ireland has joined global efforts via joining uh, this global organisation called um, Promote Pollinators. And all of this um, action has really come from bottom-up enthusiasm uh, and, and this, this hearts and minds thing where people want to do something um, and they need some guidance and some help. And, and those actions have been uh, wonderfully coordinated um, by uh, the National Biodiversity Data Centre. So I think it's a really good example of the positives. And there are other positive developments that can give us hope about biodiversity in Ireland. Um, the positive reaction to the pollinator plan, there's, there's agri-environment schemes for, for some of these specific species that are in decline, like the hen harrier, the curlew, the, the freshwater pearl mussel. Uh, there's, there's several wonderful EIP partnership projects 
um, uh, to demonstrate nature-friendly farming. There's fantastic role models um, all over the country, particularly in the Burn, uh, the Burn program. Um, and at the, the National Biodiversity Conference last year, we saw incredible political support. We saw leadership from the top with Michael D. Higgins' um, wonderful speech and legendary comment about if we were coal miners, we'd be up to the knees, up to our knees in dead canaries. Um, and we also saw the whole community coming together from across different sectors, with lots of expertise and lots of enthusiasm to make a difference. And we're seeing in the last five to 10 years, a real shift in, in, in public attitudes, a greater appreciation for nature, uh, more people taking part in citizen science, community-led initiatives. And it's great to see some of these on the program for, for the, the coming few days. And so working in partnership, breaking down the silos, all of this should lead to a, a more positive future for Ireland's natural systems. So my vision for people and nature here in Ireland I mean, I'd love to see an appreciation of nature. Uh, make sure that we have the education, the knowledge sharing, that people notice nature, take nature into account in decision making. Uh, I'd like to see more evidence base in our agri-environment policies and better implementation and enforcement of existing nature protection. We already have good nature protection um, legislation. It just needs to be well implemented and enforced. And also restoration, restoration of the habitats that have been lost. But we need to get the balance right. We need to produce food, we need to create housing, we need to accommodate tourists, but we need to make sure there's enough nature to deliver the flow of services on which we depend and also for nature itself. So I just want to give a final word um, or a final slide, uh, a shout out to my, my current research team um, in Trinity and some of the projects that we're currently working on are mentioned there. Um, and if anybody wants to find out anything further about the research we're doing, then please do get in touch. My email address is at the top of the screen, uh, my uh, Twitter handle, and also our uh, research group blog, which is called campusbuzz.blog. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to answer questions. Hi. Oh, I thought I started my video. I haven't. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. That was that was absolutely wonderful. And I know I'm conscious that you tried to, you know, compress a lot of information there in a in a very limited space of time. So, but thank you for giving an overview of where we are at as a country and and kind of goals for the future. If if you were to kind of suggest a single biggest thing we can all do for nature, what do you think that would be? Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, the single biggest thing we can do um, is, is every, I, th I think I would say this, everybody can do a little something. Um, and, and even if that little something is just persuading someone else to care, um, you know, it, it, everybody can do something. I think, you know, that the, the challenges often seem overwhelming and you think, you know, what on earth can I do that would make any difference? But, but everybody can do something and, and just raising awareness and, and taking action um, is, is easier than you think. And I think sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not knowing where to start, isn't it? So yeah, do, do a little something, give someone else a leg up um, and, and find somewhere to start. Jane, thanks a million for your talk. That was amazing. Um, I have a question here. It's from an anonymous attendee. How can we increase the funding available for conservation? Will it ever be a priority at government level, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, I think that things are changing. So um, with the EU Green Deal, with the new EU Biodiversity Strategy, um, there will, I think there will be more funding for conservation, but in, in different kinds of ways. So through changes to um, agricultural policy, for example, um, through changes to the way that we are uh, monitoring nature and biodiversity. Um, I, 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 yeah, I have to be optimistic about this. I have to think that, that things will improve, um, but I don't know exactly how. Um, thanks, Jane. This is a question from Maria Wood. Our local farmers have signed up to several conservation schemes like not cutting meadows until July 1st. However, they have no idea why they're doing this. Looking on Chardesk website, there is no information apart from how to apply. 
my neighbor regrets signing up to this scheme. How can we help him to get the information on why this scheme helps nature? Um, I, I don't know what's available on the Chagas site. I guess all I can talk about is, is what I know that's available. Um, and, and have a look at the pollinators.ie is the, the All Island Pollinator Plan website. And there's loads of information on there. Um, there was a wonderful blog that Una Fitzpatrick at the National Biodiversity Data Centre published last year on uh, the benefits of, of um, changing mowing regimes and not mowing until later in the season. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of information on there. So that, that's a website that I do know that contains an awful lot of information, so I, I'd recommend having a look at that. Uh, just uh, to plug Farming for Nature, there's a good supporting website, farmingfornature.ie as well, that also has a lot of resources for farmers to, if they want to look at how to improve nature on their farm. So Jane, here's a question from Finta Darmar. Um, are you hopeful for the new cap and the potential benefit it might have on biodiversity? As, yeah, as I say, I'm, an, I'm an optimist. Uh, I am hopeful. I mean, I hope it doesn't get watered down. I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the differences this time will be that member states will have, uh, as far as I understand, member states will have more autonomy in how they implement the cap. So I think um, it's a case of, as I say, working together. Uh, breaking down the silos, making sure that the way that we implement it here in Ireland is is the best thing, is is the best way that we can. Um, so, I I'm hopeful. Okay. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this question correctly by Linda Gilson. What does Jane think about uh, neonicotinoids in plants labeled bee friendly in garden centres? Does oh, she gosh, know what that's... is happening with this now? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so this is, so neonicotinoids are insecticides that are, are systemic, so that means that they're expressed through the, all of the tissues in the plant. Um, and there was a study a couple of years ago from the UK that showed that plants that have been grown in garden centres labelled perfect for, for, for bees or perfect for pollinators actually contained, so they've been grown uh, for the market using these um, insecticides. Um, I don't know what the the current policy is. I mean, certainly a lot of these neonicotinoids have now been banned for use uh, in, in field crops. Um, in terms of um, getting plants from the garden centre, we don't, we don't have a systematic way of measuring um, what's in these plants. So, I mean, the best way is to buy certified organic plants uh, or to grow your own plants from seed in, in, in your own um, chemical free environment but um yeah that that's the whole a whole nother a whole nother discussion about neonics uh, deborah has asked here where can we get more information on the protecting farmland pollinators um scheme or is there a leaflet out on it there is indeed um so there are links to it on the national biodiversity data center website so that's at um at biodiversity.ie um and there are leaflets and there's information and maybe if i if i share a link afterwards i'll find a link and share that um this might be a bit ex a uh, bit of an uh, interesting question by sean o'farrell how can we connect our food to nature and substitute the supermarket as a source of our sustenance Oh, that's another hard one, isn't it? It's, you know, and that's the problem is, is our food system um, is, is, is global. It's a global trade. Um, it's a global network. We import a huge amount of our food. We export a huge amount of, of what we produce here. Um, you know, we, we love to have strawberries in, in the middle of winter and, and um, tropical fruits for our breakfast. So it's, it's, you know, we, we, we can't and we don't necessarily want to produce all of our food locally. Um, it, there's so many issues, so many issues in, in that question. It's very, it's very hard to answer, but I think it is, it is part of um, the, the kind of the, the globalization of, of trade of food and, and big agriculture and, and, and really people wanting cheap food. You know, food has never been so, so cheap um, in, in terms of proportion of our income. Um, and yet that's, that's not necessarily translating in, in, a, in, in the right price to the farmer. Um, and, you know, the, the, um, the price that we're paying for a lot of our food doesn't represent the cost uh, of that production. Um, and so this is, you know, this is why I, I, I'm a big fan of these the, the natural capital approaches where we can actually put the the true 
uh, value uh, on things and, the and, and attribute the true costs of uh, some of our food production systems. And that means that prices will go up in the supermarkets, um, but it should mean that there are benefits in other areas. And, and, and it's kind of, you know, seeing those trade-offs and those costs and benefits that if you only look at one part of the, the puzzle, which is what we do at the moment, we only look at the price that we pay, um, you, you're missing the big picture. And I think that's why, why we have so many of the problems that we have uh, globally in, t in terms of biodiversity today. Okay, thanks. Um, this is a question from Nora Walls. Can I cite in relation to value of nature, in relation to submission to onboard Panola Golding, regarding a high density planning proposal on a site incorporating an SAC? Can, can you repeat that? Can I cite, I suppose, the value of nature in relation to a submission to onboard Panola regarding a high density planning uh, proposal on a site incorporating an SAC? So the value okay. of nature that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, development shouldn't happen on a, an SAC anyway. Um, SACs are supposed to be protected sites. Um, and in terms of the value, the, uh, the value of nature, as I say, until we've got a good mechanism for communicating that value, uh, then at the moment, what we can do is just say, okay, this is the nature that's there. Um, this is what it's delivering for us and kind of systematize our uh, arguments, I guess, um, and break them down into... Uh, or biophysical units, you know, so how much nature is there, uh, how much carbon is being sequestered, how much water is being retained, those kind of um, calculations. At the moment, that, that, that's all we can do. We can say that this nature is here and it's providing us this benefit um, and, and that needs to be taken into account. Um, yeah, that's a difficult one. Mm. Um, Jane, I think that is all the time that we have for for today. Um, I'm just looking at the time there. Thank you so much for for taking the questions and for your wonderful presentation. I Thank think it, gave, it gives a great perspective as we get into other events for Burn and Bloom. So uh, we really appreciate you well. taking the time to do this.